And joining us now on the line from New York, New York, to talk overeating, there's Dr. David Kessler. He is the former head of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the author of The End of Overeating, Taking Control of the Insatiable North American Appetite. And Dr. Kessler, as I welcome you to the program, I want to start by offering up this assumption, and you tell me if it's true. I suspect people think we overeat because we have no willpower. Is that right? I wish it were that simple. That, in fact, is, is not the case. The, what we now know, um, and through a lot of science uh, recently, is that the brains of millions of North Americans are literally being hijacked by all the food cues, uh, all the stimuli around us. Our behavior is becoming conditioned and driven to overeat. Go into that a little more if you would. What's actually happening in the brain to send those cues to us to say it's time to get that chocolate cake again? So let's first uh, have, understand what a cue is. It could be the smell of food. It could be the sight of uh, food. It could be just walking down the street that you've been on before. You know, I start thinking about chocolate-covered pretzels because I had been into a, a store on that street six months earlier, and just the street, the location, Every time I land at San Francisco airport, I start thinking about these dumplings because <laughs> at the food court in the airport, there's these dumplings. So that the plane just landing on the runway uh, is a cue that generates arousal. It focuses my attention. It activates parts uh, of the brain. There are thoughts of wanting. I eat the food and every time I engage in that behavior, I strengthen the neural circuits so the next time I get cued, I do it again. Now that's very interesting because of course the word you have not used there is hungry. So you're saying you don't even have to be hungry in order to overeat. Well, that's, uh, that's the key. You just uh, put your finger on it. You know, the fact is, I mean, that's what seven years ago when I got very interested in, in this subject, I was watching uh, the Oprah Winfrey show one night and there was a woman on it. And it, she struck me, and I was trying to listen and listen as a physician, to listen as a clinician. She said, I eat when my husband goes to work uh, in the morning. I eat before he comes home at night. I eat when I'm happy. I eat when I'm sad. I eat when I'm hungry. I eat when I'm not hungry. And then she said, I don't like myself. So why was she eating when she was not hungry? Why was she doing what she didn't want to be doing? That's what I wanted to understand. And the fact is the answer lies into how our, her brain uh, processes all the food and the stimuli uh, in her environment. Well, if it's, a, if it's a brain thing more than it's a hunger thing, in some respects, we're not really in control of our circumstances then. Is that fair to say? Well, there's certainly a part of the brain that, uh, where this activation, this arousal, takes place out of consciousness. And that's what makes it so difficult. But the problem is when you bring it into consciousness, if that neural circuitry has been laid down and you start thinking about it and you start thinking about you know, that inner dialogue, boy, that looks good, maybe I should have it, maybe I shouldn't, that only increases the reward value of the food and that's the stuff of obsessions and cravings. So that's why it's so very hard uh, to stop. And one more brain follow up here. What is dopamine and what is the role that dopamine plays in all of what you've been talking about? So dopamine is a brain chemical and it's part of certain neural circuits. Dopamine helps focus our attention. So if there's a fire next door, you start paying attention to that rather than to this interview. We're all wired as human beings to focus on the most salient stimuli in our environment. It's what makes us so successful as a species. And dopamine and the dopamine circuitry helps focus our attention on what's most important in our environment. For some people, they could focus, it could be alcohol, it could be tobacco, it could be illegal drugs, it could be gambling, it could be sex. But for most of us, you know, the, the mo one of the most salient stimuli, and certainly one that's readily available uh, and socially acceptable is food. And at the core of that food is fat, sugar, and salt, because it's fat and salt, fat and sugar, fat, sugar, and salt that stimulate us to eat more and more. Now, those three things aren't illegal, but you're absolutely right. They are the three things that stimulate us. So how, how do those three things in particular, fat, sugar, and salt, drive our cravings? Well, it works, obviously, through the orosensory route, uh, through uh, the mouth. And we have our taste buds 
are literally hardwired um, to the brain. And fat, uh, and sugar, and salt stimulate uh, the receptors uh, in our mouth. And especially what we know is that in combination, we can make food, in essence, more potent by certain combinations. We did a study uh, with colleagues at the University of Washington. We published it. It's not the typical scientific uh, title uh, of a journal article. It was called Deconstructing the Vanilla Milkshake. What do you think, Steve, in the vanilla milkshake is the main driver why we keep on going back um, to drink it. You think it's the sugar, you think it's the fat, or you think it's the flavor, which one? Uh, I'm gonna guess that it's the combination of the three that does it. Well, you know, that, it's a pretty good answer, but in fact, what we found is that sugar is the main driver. Hmm. And so, but when you add fat, it's synergistic. The flavor is, is the cue, but the sugar and fat, in fact, makes uh, the food more multisensory, more potent. And that's what the food industry has done over the last, last you know, several decades, certainly in the United States. What have we done? We've taken fat, sugar, and salt. We've put it on every corner. We've made it available 24-7. We've made it socially acceptable to eat any time. We've made food into entertainment. What did we expect to happen? Now, I think you know, the, the, in Canada, you have a little leg up on the United States. Your food tends to be a little more Eaten at home, uh, the portion sizes uh, are a little smaller. Uh, you don't go into your grocery stores and have 50 varieties of, of cereals. So in some ways, um, you have an advantage uh, over the states. And you know, one of the most interesting questions, you're certainly moving in the direction that we've moved uh, down here, uh, but will you be able to keep the brakes on or are you going to do what we did, which was to break down all barriers and be uh, having it socially acceptable to eat any time uh, of day? Let me follow up on that angle because, of course, people will remember your work when you were head of the FDA against the tobacco manufacturers. And one of the key breakthroughs there in taking on those companies was to really cement in the public's consciousness the notion that, that smoking is a very antisocial thing to do. Do we have to do that with ice cream parlors, fast food restaurants, other junk food places, soda pop, so that we get to the point where they are as socially unacceptable to overindulge in as smoking? You, know, you, you raise a, a very important point. Obviously, food needs to be enjoyable. It, it needs to be rewarding. It needs to be pleasurable. But you're right. I mean, what, it really, uh, what was responsible for the success with tobacco over the last several decades? The fact is... Um, that we changed the social norm when it comes to tobacco. 30, 40, 50 years ago, certainly our parents looked at that product and said it was cool. Uh, that was something that they wanted. It was glamorous to smoke. We changed the social norm. Scientists would call that changing the valence of the, pro the product. It used to be positively valence. Now it's negatively valence. But in some ways, food is much harder because we need food. Food needs to be pleasurable. We can't uh, in essence, demonize food, nor, nor should we. But some of the practices, social norms are very important, and I think we do have to change certainly some of the social norms in the United States. The large portions, the huge portions, the, the, the extent of the, to which our food has been processed and fat, sugar, and salt has been dialed in, I think we need to change, and I think we can change, how we view these huge portions of food. Is that really going to make me feel better? Is that really going uh, to nourish me? Do I really want processed food that's just going to have me come back to eat more and more? So I think we have to be careful uh, in how we change public perceptions. But social norms do affect behavior, and they certainly affect how we respond and our brains respond. I don't want to take a cheap shot at the U.S. because there's enough people in this country who do that and, and shouldn't do it. But yours really is a super size me culture, isn't it? I don't know how you got away from that because it's just absolutely everywhere in every aspect of American life. How do you tackle that? You're right. I mean, from a medical uh, viewpoint, it concerns me greatly. You know, I certainly understand how to take care of a type 2 diabetic. Type 2 diabetes, I could really just write obesity in the medical uh, chart. I know how to take care of a type 2 diabetic who gets the disease when he or she is 50 or 60, for, they live for two, three decades. But now I'm seeing the disease in 10-year-olds, and they're going to leave, live for six, seven decades with the complications. That concerns me greatly. How are we going to be able to put this back in the bottle, especially since you know, the brains 
I mean, the brains of millions of Americans have been con become conditioned and driven. It's not just us. I mean, it's our kids. We've laid down the neural circuitry so that they're constantly responding to this cue activation reward uh, cycle. It's probably the greatest public health challenge. And I think, you know, again, I think Canada's on the verge. You know, I mean, you're almost at the tipping point, and the question is what uh, direction you're going to go. I mean, you have your donuts uh, on every uh, corner. You're starting to eat out more. Um, but, you know, the question is where are you going to be in 10 years? You got Tim Hortons in New York City, incidentally? We have our version of Tim Hortons, uh, no question about it. And the problem is it's not just Tim Hortons. Uh, we have thousands of uh, establishments like Tim Hortons. I mean, what was the goal of the uh, food industry over the last several decades? When you think about it, you know, any major corporation, I mean, its real mission uh, is growth. Mm. And what does growth mean? It means you're going to sell more product. Got to hook us on all the bad product. stuff. Well, you, 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 but you, you need to sell more product. You need to keep on putting more uh, food out there. And, you know, people just eating during meals uh, wasn't enough. So we broke down the barriers and people are eating all the time. Keeping some structure, keeping food to be real food. You know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, in order to feed, you know, a continent, uh, you know, in a way that you could distribute food safely, we shifted toward more processed food. That increased the shelf life, it made food more economical, but along the way the food industry learned to dial in fat, sugar, and salt uh, and put it everywhere, literally on every corner and every uh, gas station. It's, it's now you can walk down the street and you could eat almost anything and want, no one will no, take uh, any notice. Hmm. Okay, a couple of minutes left here and I want to touch on two more things. Is it possible, as we look to rehabilitate ourselves in this department, is it really possible to change our behavior and reroute our brain circuitry to avoid eating the stuff that we should be avoiding? You can certainly add new learning, new neural circuitry on top of that old uh, neural circuitry, on top of that old learning. Do you ever get rid of that old learning, that is old neural circuitry? Probably not. I mean, if you stress me or if I'm fatigued or uh, if I'm, if, you know, feeling, uh, you know, very hungry, um, that old neural circuitry, I mean, I will uh, reach um, for, you know, the food that uh, perhaps, you know, I really don't want to be reaching for, especially if nothing else is around. But the best, best way to do it is to add new learning on top of that old learning. And the best way to do that is to change how we view food. If you look at that huge plate uh, of French fries and say, that's my friend, that's going to make me feel better, I want that. I mean, you're going to finish that whole thing. In a way, it's the same approach as alcoholism, isn't it? I mean, you've got to really look at that drink and say, that's not calling out to me anymore. Certainly, Steve, it involves the same neural circuits. It involves the learning, memory, habit, uh, and motivational circuits. So you're exactly right. These are very powerful stimuli, whether it's alcohol or, or food. And in fact, by dialing in the fat, sugar, and salt, uh, the food industry uh, over the last several decades has you know, try achieved this bliss point for food uh, where it's optimally stimulated. Now, I appreciate all your efforts on education on this, but at the end of the day, are you concerned that people will simply say, you know, brain circuitry, this is too confusing, it's too difficult, if I want to lose weight, I'll do one of those fancy diets for 60 or 90 days, and, and that'll do me just fine, thanks very much. Yeah, but, but why, why is that not in the long term? Why doesn't that work? Because we know that diets you know, don't work. Sure, in the uh, short term, you can lose the weight, uh, but then over time, you gain it back. Why? Because if you just go on a diet, if you deprive yourself, sure, the weight will come off, but unless you've added that new learning, unless you've changed how you look at food, change what you really value, what you want. You, you're going to go back into your environment. You're going to get cued. Uh, you're going to res your brain is going to uh, be bombarded with those cues. And of course, you're going to gain it back if you've not added new learning. So you know, if the fact is, you know, many of us say, look, we want to lose weight. We, want, you know, we don't want to be obese. We want to be thin. But we look at the food and say, we want the food just the way it was. And it's really not a question about obesity or, or weight. We have to change how we view food. And probably, you know, the simplest way to do it, I mean, is to eat real food. 
the, the fact is our food has in, increasingly been layered and loaded uh, with fat, sugar, and salt. Much of our food, you know, I think uh, at this point, you can question whether it's even really food. Hmm. Dr. Kessler, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight and help us with this. Thanks so much. My pleasure.